Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Welcome to episode 127 of Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. I'm Marcy Larson, Andy's Mom. So today is a replay of the live stream episode that we had just the night before last, Tuesday night. And I have to apologize because I think I have been doing a very bad job of announcing the live streams. I was better at first and we had more listeners at first, but now I think I'm not announcing it enough. I was relying just on putting it on Facebook. And I don't know if all of you know about Facebook, but when you have a Facebook page, but Facebook does not really put the information out there to people who subscribe to a page unless it's extremely popular or unless you pay the money. And I am really una- unwilling to pay advertising money to have my uh, little uh, Facebook page promoted to people who don't want to see it. So what I really would like is if all of you could like posts or share posts or try to be engaged with the post, maybe put some comments in, because that would help me to be able to reach more people. So I would appreciate you being able to do that. And then I will do a better job announcing the upcoming live stream events ahead of time on the podcast as well, just so people know to look for them. Because I do think they are better if we can get input and questions from people who are listening at the time. So in this episode, you'll notice that we didn't really have any questions. Gwen and I had plenty to talk about, so it was okay. But I do think it's better when we've got some engagement from other people. So That being said, our next live stream is Tuesday, March 29th. I am going to try to do it again at 8 p.m. If that doesn't work, then I might just move to the afternoon because if we're not getting a lot of engagement anyway, it would actually be easier for Gwen and I to do it in the afternoon. So also, if you have comments on that and you think I've made the bad choice and you really want these in the afternoon or another time of day, speak. shoot out an email. Let me know what you think might work best for you and what you would enjoy listening to the most. Because really, I am doing this for all of you. And I am doing this to try to reach as many people and help as many people as I can. And we had certainly hoped that the live stream would allow people um, a chance to ask some questions a little more one-on-one. So I might start putting out a few more of those, but do them a little shorter. And so not replay them as a podcast, but just some little short snippets that people can watch and respond to. So you might see that coming up ahead. Uh, We're just trying to just find other ways to reach people. And I do love hearing from you. So again, please, please, please don't hesitate to email me. So my email again is marcy at andysmom.com. Be sure to sign up for my email list as well. This way you will get notifications when a new podcast comes out or if there are any other kind of announcements that I want to make. I promise not to fill your inbox with unwanted emails. I use that really quite sparingly. So now just sit back and enjoy listening to Gwen and I talk about what it means to grieve as a couple. Hi. Hi, Gwen. Good to see you. Same here. So here we are for our live stream uh, podcast event. So, oh, and we get to hear my clock go off because I did not turn it off. So we can all <laughs> it's hear such a my... lovely sound. I know. It's my Andy clock. So this came was a gift from my family. Today we are here to talk about, like you just said, Mm-hmm. as a couple and going through this messy awful grieving process with your loved one mm-hmm. and how that can be hard because we do all have our own unique 
journeys. Um, but with that, we need to be, we need to be able to do it together too. Right. So it's kind of doing it together and on your own at the same time. So why don't you go ahead and start with your story? Well, uh, and, and I may have shared this um, with you on some other point before, but I just think it was such a good visual that a couple had had a child who died. I think it was, the girl was about eight years old and um, it was a sudden death and very traumatic. And the mom wanted me to come over and she was very upset with her husband and how he wasn't talking to her and so when I got to the house, she met me at the door and right away her anger just at him and how he wasn't grieving. And this man is not dealing with this. And she said, he's not even going to come into the house to, to meet with us. But as she was walking me from the door to where we were going to sit, there was a big um, picture window and a sliding glass door. And I could see the husband out in the backyard chopping wood. And I said, Wow that's a lot of wood. And she said, that's all that man has done since she died is chop that wood. And that's when I said to her, that is a lot of grief in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And she hadn't realized that maybe that was his style and that he was acting it out physically where a woman will tend to maybe meet with someone in the living room face to face and have that kind of conversation. And a man um, may be more active and more physical in their grief. So that was just a real visual for her to see that pile of wood as her husband's grief journey. And I think you said it in the intro just now is that we are unique and different and God made us different, but yet we're in marriage and we're in union together. And whether it's the death of a child or anything else that makes marriage hard, but mm -hmm. then you add the death of a child and it just compounds that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things we should dispel right away, though, and I've talked to you about it, and um, is that there is this myth, um, and it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy that a marriage is doomed after mm -hmm. the death of a child. Like people just say, oh, you're not going to make it. Very few marriages make it through that. And there's not necessarily an increased divorce rate in parents who lose a child as the average population. Yeah, it's so funny because I we certainly thought there was. I mean, I remember the night that Andy died and we were in that hospital room with Peter because he was Peter hospitalized for his concussion. And I remember Eric saying to me, this will not break us. You know, mm -hmm. we made this kind of vow to each other that very night just, you know, four mm -hmm. hours or so after Andy died that this would not break us because mm -hmm. I think we felt that we were under the gun. Like this is, right. this is somehow going to wreck our marriage and we're not going to be able to get through this as a couple. Mm -hmm. And because that was kind of what was put in my head is mm -hmm. what I thought. Right. And it was months later, actually I was interviewed on a different podcast and one of the people said, and that's a myth. There's absolutely no increase in the divorce rate. And I mm -hmm. said, Oh, really? I, I didn't know that. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it was good to know that it wasn't. Although on the other hand, it was a little bit, it was a little bit of a good thing to say that to Eric for us to have that conversation that very night, mm -hmm. because had that myth not sort of been out there, I'm not sure we would have kind of made that extra vow to each other because we really mm -hmm. did that, right. night, that this will not break us. And it was really a promise to right. each other. And I think that was good that we had. So in some mm -hmm. ways, I'm not sure it's a bad thing that it's out there a little bit, but I don't, right. but I'm like you, I don't want to feel like you're doomed. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, making that commitment to heal together is huge, but what I want to also look at is just as other things in marriage is that each one of us has our own individual thing. And if I look at it for the example of spiritual growth, I'm not mm -hmm. in charge of whether my husband reads his Bible or prays, right? right? That is his journey and what he does. And I am responsible and accountable to mine. And so someone can stay married with someone and not be in charge of their spiritual growth. You can stay married to someone and make a commitment to stay together and to grieve together the best you can, but still realize that you're not in charge of their emotional health and how well they do their grief work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It because, is. I mean, you really want 
to help them, right? You right. feel like, well, oh, how you're many, not doing it right. Yeah. You're not how, doing it right. So how many times really do women, especially, I hate to pick on us women, leave a book open in the bathroom to a scripture that they want their husband to read and, you know, like not just hitting him over the head with the book, but leaving it open. So hoping that he'll grasp this, you know, all important message. Um, well, and it's not even just that. I mean, it's simpler things too. Like I, I'm just going to give an example for dinner tonight. So okay. dinner tonight, I was making some pasta. I had Eric pull the bread out of the oven and cut the bread, which he has done before. And, and when, it, when we've got a long, thin baguette, he will cut it exactly perpendicular. And you have these teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces of bread that I have laughed at him before, like, just cut it at an angle so you can have a decent sized piece of bread, right? But he, he, he makes these little ones and Peter laughs at it. Well, today he cut it at such a severe angle that these slices of bread were humongous. They were <laughs> so crazy huge. Peter comes downstairs and he starts laughing because I looked at the bread and I thought, I'm saying nothing. Right, because mm -hmm. I have I have criticized the bread before, I'm not saying anything. Well, Peter starts laughing about the ridiculousness of this huge bread, um, but but it was it was like poor Eric, you know, he either cut it way too small or now he's way too big and he's just not mm -hmm. doing it, you know, in Peter's mind the way mom does it. Right. So anyway. Yeah. And those are good things. Like sometimes we have to let things go, but some things are important to us. But I right. think, you know, when it comes to hurting is realizing that we don't want to come to any faulty assumptions like this woman who met me at the door and said he's not grieving that was a faulty assumption mm -hmm. or you know wrong conclusions or reaching these wrong conclusions about how someone's doing so that does lead us to the fundamentals of marriage anyway is we have to communicate so this is where I'm at. So if I take, I'm just going to take spiritual growth because I started with that example and it seems to be, you know, less, I think it's a good parallel. If a, if a wife says, the wife says, I'm going to go to church and he says, I, that's not really my thing. I'm going to, but you communicate, this is what's important to me. This is what I'm going to do. Where are you at? And you have those conversations to kind of understand where each other's at. We need to do that in our grief journey as well. Right. And say, this is where I'm at. Where are you at? This is what I'm feeling. And because we are so different as male and female, um, we're going to see that in grief too. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So women tend to be more social. Um, friendships, we tell each other everything. Even in an office, I've said this before, but in an office, women will go in and say, I'm feeling kind of bloated. I have a little headache today. I'm feeling a little off. Or my husband and I had a fight. A man will go into work. He's not going to announce what happened at home. Not yeah. a chance. Mm -hmm. And so right there, we're two fundamentally different where we share and kind of ooze stuff and men don't necessarily do that. So again, they're not going to change and do that in their grief either. And I'm not saying that all men, you know, that that means that they're not emotionally, that they're emotionally crippled or that they can't do it. I've seen a lot of men do a lot of amazing, you know, outward expression, but it does kind of go against their norm. It's probably one of the first times that something so heightened has happened that they're willing to sit in a group and talk about things. Well, I even think on the podcast, I mean, how many more women do I have come on, share their stories right. than men? I have a lot mm -hmm. more women come right. on. Although it's interesting because when I do have a man on, women will like to listen to that perspective a lot, I think. Yeah. And then I will tend to have more listeners even listen to the dads than to the moms because I think it is mm -hmm. thought to be a little more unusual. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of women think maybe I'll get this, this guy's perspective because I'm having a hard time understanding what my husband's going through right. or even talking to mm -hmm. him about it and just seeing if another dad's perspective might help them a little bit. Absolutely. And it does give some insight into the fact that men are protective by nature. That's the way that they are. And they are more self-sustaining, like feeling they have to take care of, protect the mm -hmm. family, provide for, do all of that. So when the family has emotional pain, 
they want to protect them from that. So even sharing their own emotion, emotional pain seems to go against what they're trying to do is protect their family. So I think they will keep that maybe a little closer. So when you do hear a man sharing that, it just gives that light to, oh, they do have those feelings. Mm -hmm. They just might not express it in the same way we do. Well, and it is really helpful because even, even some have been on and talked about that struggle mm -hmm. about how, you know, it, it took a good amount of time. It took a lot of work. It took mm -hmm. really re-examining yourself to be able to open up in that way because it's not what comes naturally and it's not mm -hmm. what society expects maybe. Right. Yeah. You and I talked about this, but I had read a book. I um, now I uh, love and respect. So it's kind of that cycle where the Bible says women, you know, um, respect your husbands and husbands love your wives because men need respect and women need love. So those words were on purpose. So it's a book. I think it's um, Edgar's is the author. I can't think of his first name, but anyway, in there he does talk about the way men and women communicate. So even if it's not necessarily about grief, it is helpful to read some of those communication books for marriage because that will translate over. But not only does he talk about marriage, but he also talks about women raising sons and how if we want our sons to talk to us, they might not be as comfortable to say, let's sit down and let's have a talk, right? Mm -hmm. That face-to-face -face communication. So he talks in there that if you want to get the man in your life to talk, find an activity side by side to do with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even driving in the car because you, they don't have to look at you. Right. And so those kinds of things. So even taking some of those tools from marriage and raising sons will help us in realizing maybe some pointers that will help us with grief as well. Mm -hmm. So back to your chopping wood example. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, that, if he's out there chopping wood, maybe you could go, go out sit and on chop a log. Wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or chop the wood or, yeah. And or, just yeah, have that activity. Just start moving yep. the wood or doing something and that it mm -hmm. can get you kind of together and just doing something together. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. I think about Eric and I, and a lot of what was important is just being together and not even mm -hmm. saying anything. Like we right. didn't even have to say much of anything mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because if I, when I read about it and when I've had those honest talks with bereaved couples, the bedroom becomes a place of so many different things. It becomes a place of silence, maybe just physical closeness. It becomes a place of crying out. It becomes a place of, you know, coming together sexually. It, it's just a time where, like you said, sometimes you don't say anything. You just, you're together and having that. And I think those, it, it can go the whole gamut too. That's the other part that makes grief so exhausting and makes it so overwhelming is it can go the whole gamut. And I, what made me just think of this point that is good for all bereaved people, but I think in couples too, is that sometimes you just have to set your grief down. And I think sometimes for our marriage, if one spouse seems to be maybe grieving more intently it's lasting longer for them that the other spouse may be frustrated. I've heard this kind of thing like, Oh, there's, but sometimes we do have to set it down and just do something fun with our spouse too. And have that time where we can just be a couple and do something where we're not necessarily bringing the grief into that, that our marriage needs that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do that though, because then the guilt comes in. Right. right. The guilt starts mm -hmm. to come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I shouldn't be doing this. Why am I doing this? So right. But you know, one of my suggestions that. with that is go someplace nobody knows you. I mean, don't go to your local pub or saloon that you go to every Friday night to have pizza, to yeah. have your time where you're trying to just act like a fun couple. Go someplace where no one knows you. Because I remember one time um, us needing to get away with, you know, we had all the years of infertility. And then we have, you know, our infant loss and our death. And then we have three kids in five years that when we first went away as a couple, I said to Mike, I don't think we should talk about kids. That's all we've talked about for how many years. Mm -hmm. So we went away and I just, people asked us, do you have kids? I said, no. 
<laughs> Whoa. Because I didn't want to have to go there. I didn't want to have to explain. It just, I was tired. <laughs> like I, I needed to replenish and it, we needed to be about us. And he kind of freaked out because he's not used to me lying, first of all. So when people asked us, I just said, no, we don't have children. Wow. I, I just needed a break. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously think about the two of us, about Eric and me, and a couple mm -hmm. examples come to my mind. First of all, you know, we've been doing this now three and a half years, and I mm -hmm. feel like we're pretty open with each other and talk to each other. But yet, yesterday, I saw a baby in the office, and I walked in, and it was just a little kid to check for an ear infection. Mm -hmm. But he looked just like Mm. I, mean, I mean, it was crazy to me. And the whole visit, I'm in there and I'm, you know, I've got to clean out of his ears and I've got to talk to mom and I've got to keep myself together. But all I'm thinking is, mm. this looks just like my little boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing him terribly. And I actually left the room. I started to cry, which I haven't cried after a patient in a while. And I, I just started crying because it just looked just like him. So I get home that night and I said, I, I said, I saw a patient this morning. Gosh, he looked just like it. And I started to mm. cry and he said, oh, I've been having a really hard time lately. And, and I didn't know, I didn't know. And I had to, I mean, the last few days have been just really just trying. And we went to see my daughter away at college and he said, we went to see her. And I just felt like Andy should be there. She, mm -hmm. He said, I'm just noticing He's not there and I'm just missing him so much. Mm -hmm. And yet he didn't say that to me. He didn't even tell me until I mentioned to this little boy that got me so upset in the day. And I thought, oh, I've been doing this three and a half years and still mm -hmm. he felt like he needed to protect me from that right. and not tell me. And me the same, right? Yeah. I had been having a really hard time the last few days to a week as well. And I didn't tell him until I had that event that put me over right. the edge. And then I did share that with him. But but here we are still yeah. trying to protect each other and mm -hmm. trying to not get the other one down. And I mean, it I mean, felt good to that we did talk about it, though. Yeah. I mean, we just had and a definitely... little talk about it. And it, it made me feel a little better because I was feeling like, gosh, I'm so sad lately. I'm just missing him so much. And yet I don't want to act any different, right? I don't want him to know that I'm feeling much worse because it's been three and a half years. So any, anyway, right. that's kind of what was going through my own head. But yeah, I wonder if that was a little bit what was going through his as well. Yeah. There are two points that that brings up. One is that when you do finally talk about it, you realize that you're not that far off. Like he had had an experience that he could share with you. So if we're afraid to bring it up because we think our spouse is doing well, realizing that even if they are having good days, they're still open to hearing where we are. But most often, they're the people that can relate the most because you were all at that college visit, you know, visiting your daughter and having those mm -hmm. reminders. It was happening to both of you. So it's probably not that far off from what they're experiencing too, which leads me to the next thing is to name it, like name it something so that you can say, I'm having one of those days or I had one of those moments and then they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then they can say, oh, I had one too, or just to kind of touch in with each other without having to explain things, maybe just to say, I'm having one of those moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we'll just say we're kind of having an, an Andy day. Hey, that's what I'll say to my right. kids. Yep. Um, okay. Because I like that. that. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. because they, when they get more emotional and more upset and you don't want to say too much, but it, yeah. it can be easier and safer to say, are you yeah. having an Andy day today? Yeah. And then that will make, Mm -hmm. them know that you kind of get it and you're there right and then they can tell you more if they want to tell you more but they don't have to tell you more if they can't mm -hmm. i think yeah. you can do that the same with your spouse yeah. right just be able to say just and like you said to name it which gives them permission to talk about it if they want to but it doesn't it's not a requirement mm -hmm. yeah it's and different then, than yeah. telling you know tell me about it what are you thinking mm -hmm. what? yeah yeah 
And a lot of this goes back to the same kind of things that we would do in all other aspects of marriage is honoring someone else and being kind and just some good techniques. And so honoring someone else's place where they are in the days that they're having is, is just allowing them space. Like if someone's angry about something, sometimes we just need to give them their space or they just, you know, don't talk to me right now. And we honor that, right? We need to do thing in grief sometimes is, is that same honoring of where they're at and what they need to, to talk about. One of my thoughts though, is just a few of the don'ts, you know, okay. For marriages is we don't want to turn somewhere else for all of our support away from our spouse and somewhere else could be drugs and alcohol where, okay, I listen to you, but then when I deal with my stuff, I'm turning to something unhealthy for my support. And so we have to watch that because that can be a temptation that one person carries for the other, and then they don't have a healthy place. But also in turning to watching where we turn to, sometimes having help outside the family is really valuable, like having someone else to process with. Or if you go to a support group and your spouse doesn't go, that's okay, because you're getting the support that you need outside of your spouse. But what we don't want is for you never to lean on your spouse and go completely where you're just only confiding in others. And I'm only sharing with those where I'm at. And with them, we just pretend that we're okay, because that's not healthy either. And you can yeah. see that. I mean, that doesn't I like that, that though. That's really important to bring up, I think, mm-hmm. that you mm-hmm. have to try to be honest. I mean, you don't need to put everything on that person because that's a mm-hmm. lot, especially for if someone that they really just mm-hmm. can't handle that. But right. you need to put something on there or you will end up growing apart. Right. Yep. And that's back to this whole, you know, the whole divorce situation and that the divorce rate is no higher it, because. You can not talk to your spouse about many, many problems, mm-hmm. but but this could be one that you would do as well, right? So it's yeah. not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we want to have that balance between what do you need? What do I need? And what do we need together and how we do that? And, and that does come down to those conversations. Like I need to be in a group. I need to go to this. I, and, and someone else doesn't, but Hey, will you come with me for the first few sessions or will you come to at least this or, you know, so it takes those kinds of conversations to have together, to honor each other's, to do parts together and then hold parts that are separate away from our spouse. Yeah. That reminds me a lot of uh, grief share, you know, the grief Mm -hmm. share program that they have. Mm -hmm. They've got a surviving the holidays one and it has you definitely do that. This is what I need to do for the holidays. This is what I would like to do for the holidays. This is what I absolutely can't do. Yeah. So I think you can sit down and really have that list with your partner and say, this is what I need to do in my grief. This is what I sure would like to be able to do Uh with you in my grief. This is what I just absolutely can't. Right. And if if you put it in those three categories, and I think the important thing is to actually have three categories mm-hmm. because you don't want to have your spouse. It's just the everything goes in the I can't do that category. Right. You've got to yeah. be able to say we mm-hmm. are both going to have a list with three categories in it. And then let's see where the commonalities lie and where mm-hmm. we might be able to do some of these things together. But I think yeah. that's important too to say. Mm-hmm. Because there you could do both ways, right? You could have one spouse say, whatever you want, I will just do it. I will do it. Yeah. And if it makes them miserable, they're, they're just going to do it. And they're going to have mm-hmm. it all in that category of, I will do this. I will do all of mm-hmm. this. That's not healthy for that person if there are some of those things are really, really painful. Right. It, too difficult to do. So be honest with yourself about what you would like, want to do, what you could mm-hmm. do and what you can't. Absolutely. And, you know, when you brought up, you know, with the grief share with the holidays and we talked about the holidays, again, it does come back to all this communicating about what I can and can't handle, what can you handle? And it, it takes work to do that. But again, as we said before, marriage is work. 
And in order to have a healthy marriage through grief or through financial problems or job loss, it, it, it takes communication and work. Again, making sure that you're not going too far apart from each other. And I love what you and Eric decided that night. Like, yeah, we're going to be different and we're, we're both two individual people, but as a couple, we're going to stay together in this. Yeah. And it, and it kind of becomes, you know, they talk about non-negotiables in marriage and, you know, I, I hope future marriage counseling, and I think we've improved than in our day, you just said, yeah, I want to marry that person and the pastor married you. But now they, they actually do some really good classes and work and they mm -hmm. talk about non-negotiables because what are the things that are really important to you that you can't budge on and having those non-negotiables? What Eric said to you that night was a non-negotiable that you were both making that commitment is we're not going to break up. This won't break us. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my husband and I have talked about non-negotiables that we can fight and we can have all sorts of things, but divorce isn't on the table. You know, that's, that was not even an option, but for some marriages, it is an option right from the beginning. It's, it's up for negotiation. One of the things I was reading not too long ago is that some couples aren't sure they're going to make it anyway. Yeah. You know, they've mm -hmm. already, they're not sure something like this makes it harder and they may end up getting a divorce, but were they headed that way anyway? So that, you know. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I think can be a challenge, and I've talked to some moms, especially that are like this, that their spouse is not the father of their child. Oh know? yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's so hard, I think yes. too, because they're not going to grieve in the same way. Exactly. I mean, especially if it's someone that they haven't known for even that long mm -hmm. or yep. mm -hmm. it's just on the weekend or every other week or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I think that adds a huge level of complication. A huge one. But it would go back to honoring so let's say you are the new spouse who has married someone and their child is 19 and you have only known them for three years or whatever, honoring that relationship and who that person was. So my sister, after her divorce, married a widowed man. And when she called me up and said, I really like this guy, but he's a widow. What do I need to know? And I said, his wife has a place. Your ex-husband's pictures aren't going to be up at your house because when you get a divorce, you don't keep the pictures up of yeah. your ex-spouse. But I said, when you go to his home, the pictures will be up because she has a place and you need to honor her place. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing in this as honoring that relationship, even though you didn't live it or know it, but to try to take away. And I've watched a lot of people try to take away from the relationship. And I say to the bereaved person, you know, you got to. You got to hold that tight. You can't let anyone take that away from you or minimize that. So I think that's just a stand that you need to take. So the person, you can't expect them that they're going to understand and know how you feel, but you also don't have to surrender it and say, okay, I, I will minimize this because they don't know this person's. Does that make sense? Like, uh, I hope I'm not talking in circles. No, I, I, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think it really does. Mm hmm Right. I, because I think you can do it both ways, right? You can be mm -hmm. like, well, you just don't understand because he's not your son. Right. He's my son. He's not your son. Well, you need to let them be able to still try to be there for you in that mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. And even though that pain isn't the same, it's not the pain the same for anyone anyway. We've already right. talked about it. Everyone's yeah. grief is. Mm -hmm. So my pain is not the same as Eric's pain. Our grief, even though we grieve the same person, even though we're both his parents, it's not exactly the same. So I don't want people to really jump to, well, if, if he's not even his father, then he really can't understand me. Mm -hmm. Now, you better still let him come in and be what he can for you. Mm -hmm. But again, understand that he is in a different place. It isn't right. the same. But we can be there for each other. Right? And I think this is allowing me to go back to some things that I teach with people. And one of them is that expectations that we have 
not only the expectations for ourselves and how, you know, we always should on ourselves and what we should be doing, but yeah. oftentimes we put expectations on other people and sometimes they're not realistic. No matter what, those people can't live up to our expectation of how they should meet our every need. And that's one of the things I learned early on in marriage is it's not my husband's responsibility to meet my every need. It's not just realizing that we have to watch what our expectations are of the people in our life too, that they're always going to be there and they always have to stop everything they're doing and always, you know, say the right thing, do the right thing, because that's not realistic. No, but you're but right. I, we do have these expectations. I even think mm -hmm. and this is totally unrelated to grieving as a couple now, but I think of, you know, my mother died when mm -hmm. I was 21, she was 42. So obviously my grandmother lost her daughter. Mm -hmm. So I had this sort of expectation that she would understand more because mm -hmm. she lost her daughter. And so when I lost my son, she would be able to totally kind of get it and understand me. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that wasn't really the case. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we look at our support team or who's around us, I think we have to have a variety of people. So we talk about, you know, you need people to meet your physical needs. You need people that meet your emotional needs. We have people that we connect to spiritually that are the people that keep us accountable spiritually. I think it is the same thing in marriage that your spouse might not be all the people yeah. that fit in those baskets. Right. Sometimes right. I was thinking that same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes in our grief, we have to say, I can go to them for these things, but for this, I go to my grief group or I go to this group right. of moms or this is like, what I can't do. be my spiritual support person. Yeah. You can't be right. You know, what that person can't yeah. be to you that that's okay. They can't, they don't mm -hmm. have to be everything to you, Right. but you do want them to be some of them. Yes. And not pull away from them completely where you're putting all of your, and, and I do think the vulnerability, you know, we talk about physical affairs, but I do think the vulnerability of emotional affairs, that if you start confiding in someone, that's a huge temptation and that we need to stay away from not going to someone else outside of our marriage for our emotional support if they're of the opposite wow. gender. I think that's a red flag, can put us in a spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I had so many thoughts going through. I, I was going to say, you have, you have more notes. I know you do. I do. I, I don't even know where to start with it. It just is going back to some of these things. And I think what, where I'm going is that I think there are some listeners who probably have some questions that say, but you don't understand. Yeah. I'm here in this marriage and I am completely alone. This mm -hmm. person doesn't get me. And I think we have to hear that. And I think in, we're not getting any questions, but I just want to go to that question and say, we want to hear you. We do hear, you know, like I've heard that yeah and oh i've had people reach out to me okay that very thing i mean say okay. that very thing like mm -hmm. i just feel so alone it's it's yeah. been it's been mom saying yeah. i don't think he's grieving i he doesn't want to do anything he doesn't want to mm -hmm. he doesn't mm -hmm. even want to look at pictures he doesn't want to do anything yeah. what do i do right so gwen what do do? <laughs> i know i know well it's a couple things i think that we continue to communicate what our needs are the best that we can, not saying you don't listen to me or you don't talk because that's the wrong message, right? right. Rather than to say, I need, this is what I really need. I need. I need to be able to say their name or look at some pictures with you or share when and how is the best way for us to do that. And yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I think that mm -hmm. that's the best thing to say is to, this is what I really need. How could I do that in a way that's easier for you? Right, right. But then the other part says how, you know, understanding that I can get some support other places. These are some things I need from you is modeling it. So oftentimes we, when other people, they might not know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So model it. And, and when they do get it right, say, you know what? you did a great job. And that's really all I needed was for you to be able to listen to me for a few minutes right. and just do that and thank them when they get it right. And it's kind of yeah. that, teaching and that modeling and say, okay, mm -hmm. this is what we do. And <laughs> I do that with my children often. Yeah, and I was just going to um, say that. Yeah. And so I do positive reinforcement. An, yeah. Uh, and honest as a pediatrician, what do I talk to parents about? Yeah. Positive reinforcement. When they do something yeah. that you really like them doing, 
tell them that you really right. appreciated them doing it the that yeah. way. It positive reinforcement is is the best way to help someone learn. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Exactly. Much better I, than a negative. I don't have a specific example, but I know recently with our college age daughter, I we had a discussion and I said, honey, it's okay that we're having this discussion because this is what happens in, in families. And sometimes you have to have these discussions to get to this place, but it's good. Then when it was over with, I had her look back and say, see, if we had just blown up or walked away or whatever, by just digging in a few more steps, look how far we went. Yeah. And she's like, okay, I get it. You know, so again, that takes work. And that's the hard part when you're grieving. I've just recently become aware again of how exhausting grief is. So I think again, for the listener, they're going, oh my goodness, I'm yeah. so exhausted. And now I have to be the one modeling the the behaviors and reinforcing the good, but let's uh, try not to overthink it and make it too hard. And there's a lot of grace in relationships that needs to be given both ways. Well, and that's an excellent point too. Mm -hmm. right? That we need to work on giving each other grace, mm -hmm. giving yeah. ourselves grace for when we screw yeah. up, apologizing for when we screw up, just being open about that, mm -hmm. about mistakes we make. Mm -hmm. Talked about the fact that men might not be as open as women and talking, but I think sometimes we take that so far that we never ask them, how are you? Yeah right? Because yeah. in their silence, we take it as they're doing okay. They don't want to talk about it. But sometimes I've learned with the person yeah. I live with is to say, no, wait a minute. Everyone's talking about the kids or me or this or that. How are you? How are you? Like, how is this for you? And just to ask the question. See, that's a good reminder for me. I mean, I should have done that. I should do that more. I love that. Mm -hmm. Just as a good reminder to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to check in and have those check in points. And yeah. And we'll be glad we did. You know, I was giving a presentation yesterday and just talking about, you know, certain, certain things. Well, this is the example I use, Marcy, you're going to love it from my kids pediatrician. When we go <laughs> for well baby checks, right? They ask the questions. Do you have working smoke detectors? Do you wear a bike helmet? Do you wear a life jacket? You know, all these things that they ask us, right? Mm -hmm. Those are protective factors to protect the child. You wear a seatbelt to keep them safe. There are things in life that are protective factors. And one of the ones that I was talking about for them, I was talking to healthcare workers, is that some things used to just be bonuses, but now in the stress of today's world, they're actually required. Like you have to do these protective factors to survive this crazy world and of COVID and everything. So I was talking about exercise and the fact that even though I'm new to exercise and I'm new to the experience of it, and I say new, the last couple of years integrating it into my life routinely, I have this woman when I do a workout, she says, no one ever regrets a workout. And I've listened to her say that for like a year and a half thinking, lady, that, <laughs> but you know what? It's true. Once you start that critical inch, like moving a parked car, it's that first inch that's so hard. Mm -hmm. But once you move your body, you don't regret it. Yeah. So when I'm, I'm relating this back to your marriage right now, or all this stuff we're talking about might feel like that parked car. But once you do the push and you get past that first critical inch, you're not going to regret having open communication. You're not going to regret taking time to list what I need, what I don't need, and having these hard conversations. Because truth be told, it actually makes it easier and it's better for you than just passively going, well, we'll just see what happens and hope to God this all turns out okay. Yeah. Hard work. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to be encouraging in this, right? No, I'm I think it, I think it's yeah. very encouraging. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to be encouraging to those marriages, understanding that this is hard, but it is worth it. Worth it. Anything, anything worth having takes some work. It's mm -hmm. not easy. No. Nope. Yeah. That's why one of the things that I've learned about exercise and eating healthy is you can look at people and go, how did they get that body? They probably worked for it really hard, <laughs> right? <laughs> and sometimes I think people look at marriages and look at things and say, how do they have that? They probably worked really Work hard at, at having mm -hmm. some of these tough conversations. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. well, I love that. Did um, you have other points that you wanted to make? Yes. Yeah. Well, the last one, I, I, you know, we have some time left, but I do kind of want to talk about something. You and I were talking about resources. And mm -hmm. I think to those people, a couple of things. I mean, first, they can always email either one of us, both of us together. We have conversations with people all the time, which I think we're going to address a little bit, a few of those coming mm -hmm. up. But we have conversations with people. If you didn't want to share your thing in the comments or you have something that you're struggling with, you can ask us. We're not saying we know the answers, but we want to be able to help you and yes. your marriage find the answer and the support. So let us again pour into you and be encouraged to you. But with that, the one I have one resource I wanted to talk about that, you know, we both kind of know the gentleman who started it, but it's called Bereaved Dads Network and you can find them online and they're based here in West Michigan. But they have a lot of virtual groups for dads. And I, I believe when you read their story, it really came from that thought of two things. One was one, one of the men, his now wife is not the mother of his child who died. So she wasn't wanting to go to a support group. And where, where did he go kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And then the other gentleman, his heaviness of his grief was the fact that he felt like he had to carry his wife and other children so much that he just needed a space. So right. they created this. So they have coaching, you know, that you can be coached individually. They have helpful links. Like I mentioned, virtual groups, they have in-person groups, they bring in speakers, they have, you know, really good stuff. So I'd encourage you to look at the Bereaved Dads Network. Maybe mm -hmm. what I should do is post the link in the comments. Would that help if I knew? Yeah, more? go ahead. And then the other thing that we wanted to make sure to bring up today too is Starlight Ministries has coming up on uh, Friday, March 11th, their Bereaved Parents Dinner. Um, it was formerly a Bereaved Couples Dinner, but now they're just doing Bereaved Parents, so you don't have to be part of a couple to come. But they will be talking about some of these very same topics of um, mm -hmm. bereaving a couple and then just a night out kind of to go with your spouse or right. even yourself just to be with other bereaved parents who are going through the same kind of struggles because that can always be so helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I will just address when I mentioned that people reach out to both of us and we've talked about it tonight from the very beginning when you said, Eric said, you know, let's do this together. And I mentioned that commitment to heal. Well, I got a comment from someone and I just want to address it because I think it's, it's a good one. Mm -hmm. It was no way taken like as an offensive, but she said, you know, when you say healing, I, I don't understand that everyone talks about healing and I feel I'm never going to get there. And I had to explain that when we use the word healing, I think especially as bereaved parents, we think that it means that life's going to go back and we're going to get back to the way we were and everything's going to be good. And, and, and that's not what I, we mean. By healing. Right. I think they, they might think healing means wholeness. They might think that it means that everything looks just as it did before, almost like in a story or a movie where someone is magically healed and there's no scar. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that's not what life's like. In reality, healing is different. And when you're healed, you can have really messy looking scars. It's funny because the day after you told me this, Gwen, I was in the office seeing a patient and it was just a normal 10 year old well visit or something like that. And I looked in his ears and he had the most scarred up looking eardrums I had seen in a long time. So this kid had had a lot of ear infections, had more than one sets of tubes, set of tubes, and they looked messy and bad. Now he could hear beautifully. And from the outside, no one would have been able to see what his eardrums really looked like. And I thought, that's really a perfect example of what it's like when you're grieving. Because from the outside, you look the same. And from the outside, even my patients looking at me will look at me and say, oh, it's just the doc Dr. Larson. She's the same Dr. Larson that she's always been. Right. But on the inside, I'm far different. I am scarred up and messy. And it makes it hard when you can't see the scars. It makes it harder to remember that. Right. I am healing, but 
but it's a messy kind of healing. It's right. not beautiful. Yeah. Outward healing. There's, there's, you know what I mean? It's right. messy. And, and so it, I think that's what people need to remember mm -hmm. that when we say that we know it's messy. And right. It's, and this it's is how I explained it. Yeah. To the person is that you're just not bleeding all over the place anymore. Cause in the early part of our grief, it just, mm -hmm. it has to ooze out and it's, but there comes a point where it's not oozing all the time, but it is always there. So when I always think about healing is we don't have to bleed all over the place, but we are still wounded. I mean, that we're always, you know, going to be wounded. So, but that commitment to heal, and, and again, I used this yesterday in my presentation, is what are you aiming for? What are we aiming for? And we can aim for healing. Like, I want to get there. I want to get to the point that I'm not bleeding all over the place. And I want to get to a point where life, but it, what's hard is if someone says, I, I don't want to get there. Yeah. And some people do make that decision. And I think that will be a challenge to a marriage when someone says, I'm never going to get over this and um, I'm never going to be better. Right. Now, right. again, no, you're, you're never, never going to be the same. Forget, and you're never going to be, going to be the, same. the same. You are yeah. not going to be the same, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that you should stop living. Yeah. You know, and that you have to stay wounded and stay in the pain as intensely yeah, as every moment. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we don't yeah. want to be in pain every moment. No. And so the other comment I wanted to uh, talk about too, was somebody else that wrote to me. So recently we had some, I had some women on who were talking about the loss of their children. And the one son had died from a drug overdose and she had made the point of it's difficult, can be difficult with other people when your child had a hand in it, like mm -hmm. meaning that, that they were responsible in some way mm -hmm. for the death mm -hmm. happening. And I made the point that the same thing could be said for suicide. And I did not mean when I said that, that that was an all inclusive list because mm -hmm. it's certainly not. I mean, you, you go out to, there are many accidental injuries, there's all sorts of things, right? There are all sorts of reasons that you can end up kind of being responsible for your own death. I think about, you know, adults who smoke or, you mm -hmm. know, do have other bad habits that end right. up leading to an early death. So I was not trying to single out those things. And, and I think it was thought that, that maybe I was singling them out as somehow that grief being different. If anything, I think those types of grief can be a little more challenging in any mm -hmm. of those circumstances. They can be more challenging just because I think you can end up having some, I don't know. I think society can look at well, things a little bit differently, but overall yeah. it's the same grief and our grief mm -hmm. is the same. And no matter how we got there, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want people to feel like if they're, well, depending on how their child died, things are somehow different because they're, right. they're not, they're not. But right. I also think that people who have experienced death by suicide, it has been a society norm to say, well, they, they made that choice. So they, they, they are defensive against that. And so they do stand on that, you know, their child was clouded by their, you know, despair and hopelessness. They didn't, you know, wasn't as a concrete choice as people make it seem. So I do think they yeah. do stand on that a little bit. And I, I understand that. I think one of the things that you and I have talked about, and I just going to ask our listeners and understand that we're human and sometimes we're in conversations and we're saying things and they're not meant to be all inclusive or always right. this way. But as I tell my kids, you got to be a little bendy. And so sometimes we forget that you know, when we say something, it still has a bend to it. Like there's always different factors and it's different for everybody. But, it, but if we say something that you feel <laughs> like maybe we shouldn't have said or oh, yeah. whatever, absolutely, send me an email. I yeah. would love to be in communication. I could always learn and I'm always learning yeah. and trying to do more things absolutely. and do things better. And if you have questions, yeah. Well, they both have that, that teach me and, and that's, you know, and yeah. when I tell people I'm not on here as the grief expert because people have taught me and they continue to teach me and I'm, right. I'm thinking about that. Um, right. And I love to learn and I love and, to hear from people. And, yep. mm -hmm. and as long as we are alive, we have things to learn. And I will go back to what we started with tonight. As long as we're in a marriage with a partner, there's always going to be 
something we have to learn. We're never going to master that. So again, we're back to the fact that this is a hard relationship yeah. anyway. And then, you know, just to be aware of that. All right. Well, thank you so much, okay. Gwen. And thank I you. look forward to our next one will be, I think it's March 31st. That's also a Tuesday. Oh. I'm pretty sure that's our date. I, think I have March 29th. Oh, but you know what? You're right. It's the 29th. March 29th okay. will be our next day. And I think what we'll be discussing then is faith and the role of faith, because mm -hmm. we have not had a full episode on that before but if you have other questions concerns yeah you know always pop on always ask questions uh we just love to hear from people so Great. thank you much yep okay take care <laughs>